Thank you all for coming to another one of Ian's interviews. Today we're speaking to Mike Davies. He's the director of Intel's Neuromorphic Computing Lab. And they've developed a chip that's on Intel 4 process. That's on Intel 4 process. What's your minimum specification? So thank you all for joining me. Today we're interviewing Mike Davies, who's the director of Intel's Neuromorphic division. And uh, Intel's Neuromorphic ideas came from an acquisition in 2011 of Fulcrum, of which Mike was a member of that team. And today they are announcing Luihi 2, their second generation Neuromorphic chip. For sort of research and academic use, we're still a little way off commercialization, but that's what I'm here to talk to Mike about. So please join me in welcoming Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Ian. Happy to be here. So for, for those of, for those of uh, the audience that don't know what neuromorphic computing is, can you sort of summarize how it compares to other sorts of computing, but also put it in a context of what it means for Intel? Sure. So neuromorphic computing is a rethinking of computer architecture inspired by the principles of brains, uh, you know, really informed at a very low level of, of neuroscience understanding. So it, what, where that leads us is to an architecture that looks really dramatically different from even the latest you know, AI accelerators and deep learning accelerators. Uh, it, it's a, a fully memory and compute integrated uh, model. So you have computing elements sitting very close to the, the storage state elements that correspond to the neural state and the synaptic state that represents the, the, the network that you're computing. Um, the activity is very sparse. So there's a normally off state, um, not this kind of streaming data model always executing through off chip memory. It's the, the data is staying locally, not moving around until there's something important to be computed. And then the local circuit activates and sends an event based message or a spike where it, you know, in some kind of multicast distribution to all the other neurons that are paying attention to that. Probably the most fundamental difference to conventional architectures is that the, the, the computing process is kind of an emergent phenomenon. So all of these neurons are being configured and they operate as a dynamical system of sorts, which means that they evolve over time. You may not know the precise sequence of instructions or states that they step through to arrive at the solution as you do in a conventional model, whether it's matrix arithmetic steps or conventional you know, if then else types of code statements. It's, it's a dynamical process and it's proceeding through some collective interaction to then settle into some new equilibrium state. And that's the solution that you're looking for. So this in some ways has ca uh, parallels to say quantum computing, which is also computing with physical interactions between its elements in, the, in, in, in a quantum chip. But here we're dealing with digital circuits still designed in a, in a pretty traditional way with tra traditional process technology, but the way we've constructed those circuits and the architecture overall is very different from these uh, conventional processors. As far as Intel's outlook, we're, we're hoping that through this research program, we uncover a new technology that basically augments our portfolio of current processor tools, techniques, technologies that we have available to us to go and address a wide range of different workloads. This is for applications that where we want to deploy really adaptive, uh, intelligent behavior into um, you can think of anything that moves, anything that's out in the real world that is facing power constraints and latency constraints and has to deal with the unpredictability and the variability of the real world uh, and being able to make those adjustments and, and, and respond to data in real time under you know, very, very fast, uh, low power uh, mode of operation. So g given that neuromorphic computing has been part of Intel, part of Intel Labs, for a decade, and today is the you know, announcement of the second generation chip. You're mostly dealing with collaborations with research institutions, universities. Is there a defined roadmap defining a path to commercialization, or is or are, is it a case of directions and learnings through collaborations that are defining the roadmap? You know, is it is it the tail leading the dog, or is the dog leading the tail almost? 
Uh, well, it's an iterative process, so it's a little bit of both. But but first, I need to correct something. The the acquisition ten years ago actually had nothing to do with neuromorphic computing at all. Uh, okay. So yeah, that was actually about Ethernet switches of all things. So that that was our background. It's coming from the standpoint of moving data around. Um, and, and that's gone on to be commercialized technology in other business groups at Intel. Um, but we forked off and used the kind of fundamental asynchronous design style that we used in those chips and that we commercialized at, at, at Fulcrum. And then we applied it to this new domain. And that, that started about six years ago or so. But, but in any case, what, what you're describing is, uh, it, it's really a little bit of both. We don't have a defined roadmap. It is, it is about as basic research as Intel engages in. Um, which means that we have kind of a vision for where we want to end up. Um, we're bringing some, you know, differentiating technologies to uh, this domain. So in particular, this asynchronous design methodology that I, I just mentioned. Um, but really, we, we did the best we could going back in the pre-Loihi era in developing an architecture, a chip design using, you know, all these best methods that we have available. Um, but that's about as far as we could take it as as one company operating in isolation. And that, so that's why we released Loihi out to an ecosystem. Uh, it's been steadily growing and we're seeing where this architecture um, you know, performs really well and where it doesn't perform well. And, and there's been surprises in both of those uh, categories. And so based on what we learn now, we're advancing the architecture. That's what's led us to this next generation. Um, while While we're also looking for possible uh, near-term applications, which may be specializations of this general purpose design that we're developing, um, that we might be able to incorporate into uh, our mainstream processors, hidden away in ways that maybe a user or a programmer anyway wouldn't have to um, you know, see is, is, is there present in the chip. So this new presser, processor, um, I'm hoping to have a video on it go up roughly the same time as this interview. Um, but you know, just to show off, I do have Loihi version one. Um, your your team lovingly sent this to me a while ago, and I promised to do a content on it. I promise I will get there. Um, but there are research institutions. We've got um, national laboratories and also some big commercial clients playing around with these chips. Do you expect them to move straight into the next generation Loihi? In pretty much all respects, Loihi 2 is uh, superior to Loihi. So I expect that pretty quickly these groups are going to transition to Loihi 2 um, as soon as we have the systems and the materials available. We're, we're just like with Loihi, we're starting first at the kind of the small scale, single chip, couple chip systems. We build a 768 chip system with Loihi 1. That's not going to be around you know, anytime soon with Loihi 2. So, so that system will still get used and uh, you know, will be uh, uh, sticking around for a while. So the interesting thing that a lot of people about with Luigi 2 that a lot of people might um, look at is that this is kind of the first announced product using Intel's four process, which is you know, the first EUV process on Intel. Is there are there any inherent advantages to the design that makes it beneficial for that Intel four process, or is this just an opportunity where technology development and Intel Labs can integrate together with you know, small chip design? Well, the uh, certainly from a broad perspective, neuromorphic computing, more so than pretty much any other types of computer architecture, really needs Moore's law. So we need tiny transistors, we need tiny storage elements to represent all the neural and the synaptic state, which is really one of the most critical aspects of the commercial economic viability of this technology. So for that reason, we always want to be on the very bleeding edge of Moore's law uh, to uh, to, to get the greatest capacity in a network in a single chip and not having to go to 768 chips to support you know, a, a modest size workload, let's say. Um, so, so that's why fundamentally we're at the, the, the leading edge of the process technology. Um, now, yeah, EUV you mentioned, that simplifies design rules, which actually is really great for us because we've been able to iteratively advance the design, always staying at a you know, design rule clean state, being able to quickly iterate test chips. And uh, you know, as the process has been evolving, we've been able to evolve the design and get feedback from the silicon. So, so it's, it's been great for that uh, compared to say past processes that, that have uh, been on a different trajectory where it was getting more and more complex and difficult to, uh, to close uh, chip designs. 
So part of the announcement today involved, you use language that says pre-production of Intel's four process. So how much does that mean there is actually silicon in the lab versus what's being simulated? Oh, we have chips in the lab. And in fact, as of tomorrow, they'll be available for uh, our ecosystem partners to actually kick the tires and start using. Um, as always, it's the software that's really the, the, the slower part to come together. So um, th that said, it's not the final version. So this process is still in development. Uh, you know, we aren't releasing products. So uh, to correct what you said earlier, Loihi he too is a, is a research chip. So there's a different standard of, of quality and reliability and all these uh, factors that go into de releasing products. Um, but it certainly, uh, the process is clearly healthy enough that we can uh, deploy chips, put them on system boards and remotely access them, you know, measure their performance and, uh, you know, make them available for people to use. We've been, our, my team has been using these for quite some time and now we're just flipping the switch and saying, okay, now our external users can start to, to, to use them. So, uh. But, but yeah, we have a ways to go both, uh, indeed, in the design. We have more uh, versions of Loihi 2 in fab. So it's it's an iterative process, as I, as I mentioned, and it continues even with this release. So there won't, ex won't specifically be one Loihi 2 design. There may be variants on a theme for different steppings, depending on. Sure, yeah. We, we've yeah. frozen the architecture, in a sense, and we have most of yep. the capabilities all implemented and done, but yes, it's uh, we're not completely done with the final version that we can uh, deploy with the you know all the final properties we want. I think the two big tech specs that most of our readers, most of our uh, watchers will be interested in is the die size from Loihi 1 to Loihi 2 down from 80 square millimeters to about 31, if I remember correctly. Neurons 60, going from 60 100... 60 to 31. Mm -hmm. 60 to 31. And then neurons going from about 130,000 to a million. Mm -hmm. um, what else does Louis He2 bring to the table that Louis He1 didn't? So the, the biggest change is uh, a, a huge amount of programmability that we've uh, added to the chip. So uh, we were kind of surprised with the applications, the algorithms that started getting developed and quantified with Louis He that uh, we found that actually the more complex the neuron model got, the more application value we could measure and we could we could see. Uh, there was a kind of a school of thought going back several years that the particular kind of neural characteristics, the neuron model, don't matter that much. That really what matters is the parallel assembly of all these neurons. And then that emergent behavior I was describing earlier is kind of what, what matters. But um, but since then, we, we've just found that actually the fixed uh, functions in Loihi have proved to be a limitation for um, supporting a broader range of applications, different types of algorithms. And some of these, you know, they get pretty technical as far as uh, into the weeds uh, 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 to, to sort of explain. But but as an example, uh, one neuron model that we wanted to support but couldn't with Loihi is a, an oscillatory neuron model. So when you kick it with one of these events or spikes, it doesn't just kind of decay away. Uh, it actually oscillates kind of like a pendulum. And this is thought in neuroscience to have some connection to the way that we have, you know, brain rhythms you may have heard about always pervasively in the brain. But in the neuromorphic community and even in neuroscience, it's not been really too well understood how you computationally use these kind of exotic oscillating neuron models, um, especially adding kind of extra little nonlinear mathematical terms to that, which some times people study. And, and so we, we were exploring that direction. And we found that actually there, there's great benefits that and, and we can practically construct neural networks with these interesting new bio-inspired neuron models. And they effectively can solve the same kind of problems, but they can shrink the size of the networks and the number of parameters to solve the same problems. They're just the better model for the particular task that you want to solve. So, so it's those kind of things where, as we saw more and more uh, examples of this, we realize that this is not a matter of just tweaking the behavior in Loihi. We really have to go and put in a more general purpose, almost like an instruction set, a little microcode executor uh, for, that implements individual neurons uh, in a much more flexible way. So, so that's been the big change kind of under the hood that we've implemented. And we've done that very carefully to not kind of deviate from the basic principles of neuromorphic architecture. So, you know, it's no, not a von Neumann processor or something. There's still this great deal of parallelism and locality in the memory and the, the, these opcodes that get executed. 
um, that, that so we don't compromise on the energy efficiency, for example, as we go to these more complex neuron models. So every every neuron can do the same work. It's not as if it's split to only 1% of the neurons have this addi additional computational complexity. That's right. That's right. So what we do is, uh, you know, in, in Loihi, we had basically one very configurable neuron model, and each individual neuron could kind of specify different parameters to customize uh, to that particular part of the network um, with some constraints on how, how you know, diverse you could configure. The same idea applies. You can define a couple different programs, and different neurons can kind of reference and use those different uh, those different styles of programs in different parts of the network. One of the big things about Luihi was you had this one tiny chip which could act on its own, or as you say, the Poihi springs have 768 chips all in a box. Um, can you give examples of what sort of um, workloads are on that single chip versus the sort of bigger systems? And does that change with Luihi 2? So fundamentally, the kinds of workloads don't necessarily change. That's one of the uh, interesting aspects of neuromorphic architecture in that it's similar to the brain. Uh, it, you know, it's more and more brain matter, the, the sort of the, the particular types of functions and features that are supported at these different scales uh, don't, don't change that much. Uh, so for example, uh, one workload we demonstrated is um, a similarity search function. So searching through, let's say, you know, an image database, you might think of it as, uh, give it a, a, an example image, you want to query to find the closest match. And, and so in the large system, we can scale up and support the largest possible database of, of images. Um, but on a single chip, you, you perhaps perform the same thing just with a much smaller database. Uh, and, and, and so if you're deploying that in, in an edge device, some kind of mobile drone or something, you may be very limited then in a single chip form factor to uh, the, the types of the varied range of different objects that it could be detected. If you're doing something that's more data center oriented, you'd have a you know, much richer space of possibility there. That, that, this is one area generally we've, we've improved a, a lot. Uh, so. Uh, the the effective bandwidth between the chips proved to be uh, a bottleneck. So we did get congestion despite this highly sparse style of communication where we're usually not transmitting and then we only transmit infrequently when there's uh, information to be processed. Um, it, the, the congestion, the, the bandwidth offered by the interchip links in Loihi was so much lower than what we have on chip that inevitably that started becoming bottlenecks in that 768 chip system for a lot of workloads. Um, so we've we've boosted that in Loihi 2 by um, by you can over 60 times actually if you consider all the different factors of the raw circuit speeds, um, the compression features we've added now to reduce the need for the bandwidth to reduce redundancy in that traffic, and we've added a third dimension so that now we can scale not just planar networks meshes of chips but we can actually have Radix 6 uh, scaling so that we can go into 3D. It's one of the things I remember when Loihi came out on these first boards is that you have, you know, these sort of custom connectors at the end um, when you scale out the multiple chips and there's, you know, FPGA backed. With the with the new Loihi 2, you're moving to Ethernet. So that simplifies because there's already deep ecosystem based around Ethernet. Yeah, so so the Ethernet is is to address uh, a, another limitation of a different kind uh, that we see with neuromorphic technology. It, it's hard to integrate it into conventional architectures. So we we did a very purest asynchronous interconnect on Loihi one that allows us to scale up to these big system sizes, just natively speaking, asynchronous spikes chip to chip. But of course, at some point, you want to interface this to conventional processors, conventional data formats, and so that's the motivation to go and put in a standard protocol uh, that that allows us to stream um, standard data formats. We have some accelerated spike encoding processes on the chip so that as we get real world data streams, we can now spikeify it, uh, you know, convert it in, in, in a more efficient, fast way. So, that, so it's for integration into conventional systems. One of the things you said earlier, I think is important, is that the chip spends most of its time off and you end, you end up dealing with you know, spikes of information and events going on. So how should we think about the thermal design power of these chips? It's not a massive hundreds of watts beast, right? 
Not at all. Not at all. Uh, it, there is a, a really big dynamic range, though. So um, Loihi typically in a kind of a real world workload, processing, say, gestures, you know, on a human time scale would operate on around 100 milliwatts. Um, now, if you're computing something that's more abstract computational, though, where you don't have to slow it down to human scales, say, solving optimization problems. We, uh, you know, the, the German railway network, we, we took a workload from there and mapped it on there. You just want an answer as fast as possible. Maybe you have a batched up collection of problems to solve. In, in that case, the power can, can peak above one watt or so in a single uh, Loihi chip. Um, Loihi 2 will be similar, but we've, we've put so many performance improvements into the design. Um, reaching upwards of 10 times faster uh, for, for some workloads, uh, over 10 times, that um, if we want to, we could operate Loihi at a fairly high power level. Not that we need to for real-time, human timescale kind of uh, workloads, but, uh, but yeah, the, the, that thermal design PowerPoint uh, could be a, a considerably higher if we, if we start to seriously target these kind of more data center batched mode of computational problems. Speaking about the sort of uh, human real world timescales, one of the discussions I think I had um, either with you or your team before is that one of the issues neuromorphic computing has is that the sensors, the type of sensors needed for neuromorphic computing are different to, say, traditional sensors like cameras. You need something that provides data in a spiking format almost, and you need the sensors to do that. So at what level is... Intel's neuromorphic team helping on the sensor front. So yes, that's that's a a definite need there to in in some cases rethink sensing all the way to the sensors themselves, um, and and we've seen that with vision sensors. Uh, these emerging event cameras are are fantastic for directly. Uh, producing spikes that go speak the language of, of Loihi and, uh, and other neuromorphic chips. Um, we are um, certainly uh, collaborating with some of those, those companies developing those sensors. Um, and there, there's a big space of interesting possibility there for you know, really tight coupling between neuromorphic chips and the sensors themselves. Um, generally, though, it's... Um, it, what, what matters more than just the format of the spikes is the is for the data stream to be somehow a, a temporal one where it, it's not static snapshots that are collected at synchronous intervals. That's the problem with a conventional camera for for neuromorphic interfacing, um, but but more um, an evolving temporal signal. So audio waveforms, for example, are are great for processing. And in that case. It's it's um, we can look at bio inspired approaches. So in in the audio case, this is an example where with the more generalized kind of neuron models in Loihi, we can model the cochlea, for example. And the cochlea is a bio biological structure that converts waveforms uh, into spikes, and doing that uh, simultaneously making a kind of a spectral transform of looking at different frequencies. So so that's the kind of thing where. Uh, the, the sensor part of it, we can still use a standard microphone, but we're going to change the way that we convert these signal streams that are fundamentally time varying uh, into these discrete spike uh, outputs. And, and uh, yeah, it's a very important part of it. Um, tactile sensors are another uh, example where we're collaborating with people uh, producing these new types of uh, tactile sensors, which clearly you want to be event-based. You don't want to read out all the tactile sensors in a single sy synchronous ta snapshot. You want to know when you've hit something and respond immediately. So here's another example where the kind of bio-inspired approach to sensing uh, tactile sensation is, is, is really good for neuromorphic interfacing. So would it be good to say that neuromorphic is perhaps best for interrupt-based rather than polling-based? Sure. Yeah. In a very conventional computing mindset, absolutely. Yep. That's, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. So how close is Luigi 2 to a biological model? I mean, neuromorphic is usually transposed into a brain, um, but now you're adding in more compute at the neuron level, you're doing more 3D. Um, are, are you diverging from a traditional biological model in that sense? No, I, I wouldn't look at it that way. I think our, our guiding kind of approach from the beginning is to understand the principles that come from the study of neuroscience, and not to copy feature by feature. So 
Um, so we've added a bit of programmability into our neuron models, for example. Okay, biology doesn't have programmable neurons, but the reason we've done that is so that we can support the diversity of, of neuron models that we find in the brain. And it, it's no coincidence, I think. It's not a, a, just a quirk of evolution that has produced uh, thousands of different unique neuron types in the brain. It's not all one size fits all. So we can try to design a chip that has thousand different hard-coded circuits that each one of which is trying to mimic exactly a particular neuron, you know, or we can say, no, we just need diversity. That's the lesson that comes from evolution. Let's give just the minimal feature set that lets us cover, you know, that, that range of neuron model. Yes, kind of mixing an FPGA with a neuron model. Yeah, yeah. In, Actually, in, in many ways, that is the most uh, the close parallel to a neuromorphic architecture. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, so one of the applications that you've been presenting with Loihi in the past and with Loihi 2 is optimization problems. We're talking Sudoku, you mentioned train scheduling and puzzles. Um, one thing perhaps I haven't seen it is with combative applications, say chess and Go are obviously the two biggest ones there. Uh, can the neuromorphic approach differ to the traditional you know, machine learning approach for those problems? Does, is that applicable? Well, it, that's a, a yeah a really interesting direction for research that we haven't uh, gone deeply into yet. Uh, if you look at the uh, best performing um, you know adversarial type of uh, you know reinforcement based learning approaches that have proven so successful there, uh, the 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 key is to be able to run many 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 different trials in you know fa vastly accelerated to what a human brain could process and learn from all of that. Um, so th this is a, a domain where it, it starts being a, a little distant from what we're focused on in neuromorphic because we're looking at human timescales by and large, pro processing data streams that are arriving in, in real time, adapting to that in a way that a brain adapts. If we're trying to learn in a superhuman way, uh, you know, all kinds of correlations in the game of Go that uh, human brains struggle to achieve, I, I could see neuromorphic models being good for that, but we're going to have to go work on that acceleration aspect and have them, um, you know, speed up by by vast numbers of times. But I, I think there's definitely a, a, as a future direction. I think this is something that uh, eventually we'll we'll get to, and particularly a, a deploying evolutionary approaches for that, where you know we can there's there's vast parallelism, of course, in nature in how it evolves uh, uh, these different networks. In, in a very kind of distributed um, adversarial game, you know, of, of evolving the best solution, uh, we can absolutely apply those same techniques neuromorphically. And that would be a, a guiding uh, motivation to build really big neuromorphic systems in the future, not to achieve human brain scale, but to go well beyond human brain scale to evolve the, the, the best uh, performing agent. To, to draw some parallels to normal computing, um, with the standard processor, we have the concept of instructions per clock, um, what's the equivalent metric in neuromorphic computing? And you know, specifically, how does Loihi 2 compare to Loihi 1? How should we think about that? So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it gets into some nuances of this field. Um, there are metrics that we can look at, things like um, the number of synaptic operations that can be processed per unit of time, similar to a max per second, or the max per second per watt, or synaptic energy. Uh, neuron updates per time step or, or per, per unit of time and the numbers of neurons that can be updated. Um, and so in, in all, of, all of those metrics, we've improved low E2 by, over low E1, generally by at least a factor of two. Uh, so it's just, as I was saying earlier, it's uniformly better by a big step than low E1. Um, now, on the other hand, we tend to not really emphasize, at least in our, in our research program, those particular metrics. Because once you start fixating on these specific ops and try to optimize them, you're basically accepting the fact that, OK, we know what those ops are, and let's go optimize them. But um, in the neuromorphic range, uh, domain, th there's just no clarity yet that, you know, as there is, say, for a deep learning accelerator, you want to crank the greatest number of max per second, right? But in, in the neuromorphic world, a synaptic op, take something as simple as that. Well, should that operation support a de propagation delay, which is another parameter? Should it allow the weight that it applies to multiply with a strength that comes along with that spike event? Um, should the weight evolve in response? Should it change for learning purposes? 
these are all questions that we're looking at. So before we really fixate on a particular energy number for this op, we want to really figure out what the right op is. Um, so, so as I say, I mean, we've improved certainly low EH2 over low EH1, uh, and and by uh, you know large measures. But I think we're we're all, energy as an example is one that we haven't aggressively optimized. Instead, we've chosen to uh, augment with programmability and speed. Uh, because generally what we found with Loihi is that we got huge energy gains purely from the sparsity, from the activity, the architecture aspects of the uh, of the uh, design. So we don't need to take, you know, a thousand times improvement and make it 2000 times. Uh, you know, that's good enough. We want to kind of balance the benefits a little bit more to the um, versatility and the performance gains that we get. One of the announcements today is also surrounding software. Um, you said in, in, in our briefing earlier today that there's no sort of universal collaborative framework for neuromorphic computing. Everybody's kind of doing their own homespun things, and Intel's introducing this new framework called Lava because traditional TensorFlow, PyTorch, or that sort of machine learning doesn't necessarily translate to neuromorphic. Um, how is Intel approaching you know, industry collaboration for that standard? And I guess another point there is, will it become part of Intel's one API, if you happen to know? So there are maybe components of, of Lava we might incorporate into uh, one API, but uh, really Lava, uh, the software framework that we're releasing, is it, it's, it, it's a beginning of an open source project. So it's not the release of some finished product that we're sharing with our partners. It's really, we've set up a basic architecture and we've contributed some software assets that we've developed uh, from the Loihi generation. But really we see this as uh, building on the learnings of this previous generation to try to provide a collaborative path forward to address the remaining software challenges that still exist and are unsolved. Some of these are very deep research problems. Uh, but we we just need to get more people working together on a common code base because until we get that, pr progress is going to be slow and and that's inevitable. You have to have different groups building on other people's work, extending it, enhancing it, and polishing it to the point that non-specialists can come in, take you know some of these best methods that they may have no clue what magic neuroscientist ideas are you know have informed that low level uh, development but are just understandable and wrapped up to the point that they can be applied so we're not at that stage and and it won't be an intel product it won't be an intel so lava software it's going to be an open source lava project that intel contributes to in that sense so speaking on the angle of um, getting people involved, um, I know this is kind of really early announcement right now, um, but to what scope is there for Luigi 2 to say getting on a USB stick and in the hands of non-traditional researchers, you know, homebrew use cases? Um, I assume you would like to go there, but is, is there a plan to? There's no plan at this point. We're, we're looking at possibilities for um, scaling out the availability of Loihi 2 beyond what the mode we were in with Loihi 1. Um, but we're taking it step by step because right now we're just you know uh, unveiling the first cloud systems that people can start to access. Um, and you know we'll, we'll gauge the response and the, uh, the, the interest in lava and how that you know lowers the barriers for entry to using the technology. Um, one aspect of Lava I didn't mention is that, that people can start using this on their CPU. So they can start developing models that will run incredibly slowly, of course, compared to what the neuromorphic chip can accelerate. But um, but at least if if we get more people using it and th this, this nice dynamic of building and polishing uh, occurs, as I described, well, then that will create a motivating case then to go and make the hardware more widely available. And so I certainly hope we get to that point, but it's going to depend on how how it all proceeds. If there's one main takeaway about neuromorphic computing that people should, after reading and listening to this interview, what should it be? Well, I, I think that it's uh, that the the future is bright in this field. I, I think I'm really very excited by the results we had with that first generation, and Loihi two addresses very specific pain points, which should just allow it to scale uh, even better and just really impactful application demonstrations that. Uh, uh, you know, were not possible with that first generation. So 
um, stay tuned. And I think there's really uh, fun times to come. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you for your time and good luck. Absolutely. Thanks, Ian. If you like this content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We also have now a private Discord server. And if you want access to that, become a Patreon member and it will instantly add you as long as your emails are linked. You can join the Patreon for as little as $1.50 a month and it all goes back into helping the channel. Thank you for your support.